Let me ask you to get your Bibles. Turn with me the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. And as you do that, let's be mindful of our brothers and sisters around the world who would long to do what we're about to do, and that is to open the entirety of God's Word in our language, in our lap, on our phone, and we do it freely. We're a, we're a blessed people. Mark chapter 5, I'll begin reading in verse 21 in just a little bit. Here's the title of my message, Let Me Introduce You. Let Me Introduce You. It was, it was December of 1988. I was, a, I was a pastor in Ohio at the time. I was a single pastor. That is, I was, I was unwed. And my secretary called me into my office one day, actually called me into her office, and said, have a seat, Pastor, we need to talk. Now, usually it was the other way around, but this time this is the way it happened. She called me and she said, we need to talk. I sat down, she said, there is this girl at Hamilton West Baptist Church that you just have to meet. Now, I've checked her out, and everything I can find out says that she is perfect for you. Her name's Pam. Her single adult group is having a Christmas party on this date. I've cleared your calendar uh, so you can go, and I will expect a full report. <laughs> and you have to understand, I'd been a single pastor then for seven years, and so this was not un unusual. I'd been here before. Somebody introducing me, trying to introduce me to somebody. It seemed like everybody who was breathing tried to fix me up with somebody else who was breathing. And so, so. I, I really didn't think much about this. I took it with a grain of salt, and in fact, so lightly did I think about it that I forgot her name before the party ever took place. Well, I didn't want to go back to my secretary and tell her that I forgot the girl's name, so I thought, well, whatever, I'll just go and I'll check out everybody. And if, if there's somebody that I like, maybe that'll be the right one. So I did, I went, I checked out everybody briefly, and there was this girl, and I remember a, a really cute smile, a, a great sense of humor, a gentle spirit, and a face that radiated joy. And I learned her name was Pam, and I remember that's what my secretary said. And I thought, hmm, well, what do you know? Maybe, maybe this one might work. A little over two years later, we married, and my life has never been the same. You see, something, something just happens when somebody introduces you to the right person. Something just happens when somebody introduces you to the right person. It happens in marriage, it happens sometimes in business, and it surely happens in our Christian walk when somebody introduces us to Jesus. We go to a story today of a woman whose life is changed when she is introduced to Jesus. Pick up in verse 21 of Mark 5. I start here just to give you the context. You can't really understand the story of this woman with the blood disease without the enveloping story of Jairus and his dying daughter. So we pick up in verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And the text tells us again, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Then we pick up with this interruption in verse 25. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. 
But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And then the story with J. Iris picks up again in verse 35, and you see this sandwich effect of these stories. But I want us to focus on this woman with this blood disease. Let's pray and ask God to bring his word to life for us. Father, take this word and drive it into our hearts through the power of your spirit. God, for those who are hurting today, I pray for renewed hope. I pray that you would challenge us to introduce others to the Redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you've got your pencil, your pen, you're typing in your phone, let me give you the first point I want us to see from this text. Here's number one. All around us are hopeless, hurting people. All around us are hopeless, hurting people. And I want you to get into the story again. Here's the context. Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, has a daughter who's dying. And so he comes running to Jesus and says, please come touch my daughter so that she will get well and live. And Jesus agrees to go, and off they go. And the text twice tells us there is this crowd that is thronging about Jesus. In fact, one gospel writer says, in essence, they're almost crushing up against him. And so you get the picture of this crowd moving, and I suspect they're moving rapidly because J. Iris' daughter is dying, and surely he's leading the way to get to his home. And, and somewhere in this crowd is a woman. She's quite desperate. We learned this about her. She'd been suffering from a blood disease for 12 years, for more than a decade. She'd been suffering from what was likely a uterine problem, and surely she had experienced physical discomfort and physical weakness, and perhaps even more devastating for her, she would have been ritually unclean and could not have gathered in a place like this. She would not have been welcomed to participate in normal community in her day. And we read that she had sought the answer. She had gone to the doctors, and no, no human being had an answer for her. No human efforts had accomplished anything. In fact, I think about that. I think about her life over the course of a decade, and I can, I can envision her awakening one morning and thinking, well, maybe today this doctor has an answer. She went to that doctor and spent her dollars, and he had no cure. And she lay down that night, a little bit of hope disappearing, and then the next day the sun arises again, and, and she thinks, well, perhaps this day this doctor will have an answer. And again, she spends her dollars, and waste her time, and he has no cure. And again, she lay down that night and hope again, dissipating, and on and on and on it went in her life. Year after year, it was like that. The phrases are vivid in the text. They're just piled up. She suffered at the hands of many physicians. She spent all that she had. She was not getting better. She just kept growing worse. And why should, why should this day, at least at the beginning of this day, why should this day be any different for her? It's just another day, another doctor, another treatment, another failure, another day of defeat and despair and discouragement and depression. And that's where our world is. So it is in our world today. How many of the 7.5 billion people in the world got up today wondering why should today be any different? And how many of them are looking for answers in all the wrong places, some looking to false gods who can't make a difference? How many of the 3 billion people in the world who have little or no access to the gospel wonder today if anything would ever change? Look around us. Look around and see people who are searching and suffering and spending and not getting better and only growing worse. And that's our world. That's the crowd around Jesus. We can only wonder how many other people in this crowd thronging against him felt that way. We know J. Iris was there, and surely there were more. Why should today be any different? That's our world. But this passage is not about our world. It's not about peoples. It's about a woman, 
One woman, unnamed, but nevertheless an individual. Somebody's daughter, somebody's neighbor, somebody's friend. And that's where, that, that's where this passage strikes at me because, you see, it's one thing to talk about a hopeless world out there somewhere. It's a whole other thing to put a face on hopelessness by looking into the eyes of a lost neighbor, a lost coworker, or a lost family member. All around us are hurting, helpless people, and I, f- I fear we miss them. I fear we miss them. I'd been pastoring in Ohio for 10 years in the same city when I had an opportunity to to spend nine weeks as a long-term substitute teacher in the public freshman high school. If you want to learn what's going on in your community, go do that. And those nine weeks, here's here's what I learned about. I learned about gangs in my city that I didn't know existed. I watched as as some of the children, my own church members, were expelled from school for drug abuse. And I didn't know they had a problem. I listened to young people, some 14, 15 years old, who were being passed from home to home to home because nobody in their family even wanted them. And I listened through those nine weeks, and I went back to my office in my church, and I sat there thinking I'm a veteran pastor in a city that I don't really know. Because I had done my ministry, but I had done it in my church building, and I missed the very hurting and desperate people around me. All around us are hopeless, hurting people. And let me just say to you, if you don't know anybody like that, you may need to get off this campus. Or you may need to look around because they're on this campus too. All around us are hopeless, hurting people. Here's number two, second truth. It matters. It matters that we direct people to Jesus. It matters that we direct people to Jesus. All around us are these hurting people. Here's this woman before us. She's hurting. She's hopeless. Why should today be any different for her? Well, we get a hint. Look with me at the text. We learn just a little bit, just enough to know why today is about to be different. Verse 27, Mark chapter 5. She had heard the reports about Jesus. She'd heard the reports about Jesus. Do you know why this day would be different for her? She'd heard something about Jesus. We don't know the origin of that. Maybe she just overheard the crowds as they're talking about what they've heard about Jesus. Or maybe somebody came to her and told her the story circulating about Jesus. I've, I've heard that he can touch the blind and they see again. And I've heard, they can, I've heard that he can touch the deaf and they hear again. And he touches legs and people walk again. And I've even heard he can raise the dead. And or maybe it was somebody who knew Jesus personally, who had met him, who came to this woman. You've got to go. You've got to go see this one who can do what nobody else can do. After all, who is this? Who is this Jesus? Well, in Mark's gospel to this point, here's who he is. He's the Son of God. Proclaimed that way three times in chapter 1. He's the teacher who taught like nobody else. They were astonished at his teaching because he taught with his own authority. He was the exorcist whose very words drive the demons out. He was the healer of paralytics, of lepers, of withered hands, and of mothers-in-law. He's the master over nature. He's the master over demons. In this chapter, he's the master over sickness, and he will be the master over death. This is the one who's just plain worth talking about. Is Jesus the Son of God? Well, who was it that spoke to this woman? Who were the unknown characters that gave the reports about Jesus? We don't know. But you know what? It doesn't matter because the story is never about the witness anyway. Our job is to tell others about Jesus, whether or not our name is ever recorded in the story. It matters that we talk about him that we direct people to him. Whoever it was, 
And whatever this woman heard, it was just enough to prick her heart to think, if I can, if I can just touch his garment, I will get well. And somehow, somehow she makes her way through that crowd, breaking all the, the social mores. She's an unclean woman going to the rabbi. And somehow she gets to, to Jesus, and with a faith that Jesus would later commend, she touches the hem of his garment, the, the tassels on his cloak, and her blood disease dries up, and in typical fashion in Mark's gospel, it happens immediately. And this day would be different for this woman. Her life would never be the same. Her world would change. Her hope would return, and here's why. Somebody had introduced her to Jesus. Somebody had introduced her to the right person. Hear me again. It matters that we tell people about Jesus. All around us are hopeless and hurting people, so it matters that we tell people about him because he's the one who can change their world. That's why hopeless people, hurting people who got up this morning wonder why today would be different. That's why it can be different. Jesus can change their world. Hopeless, hurting people around us. It matters that we direct people to Jesus. Here's truth number three. Jesus is the right person to whom we direct others. Jesus is the right person to whom we direct others. And I get it that that's really basic. I understand we're in a seminary chapel, and I've just said to you, Jesus is the answer. He's the right person that we direct. I get it. That's really simple. But you know what? I think it's so simple we stumble over it. And we forget the simplicity of the beauty of the gospel. You see, the story doesn't end with the physical healing. It doesn't end with this woman's blood disease drying up. It shifts to a dialogue that becomes the focus of this text as Jesus draws this woman out. She touches his garment, and he senses that something has happened, and he says, who, who touched me? Not because he didn't know he's the son of God, but because he's going to draw her out. He has something more for her than just physical healing. She comes to him fearing and trembling, perhaps thinking in her mind, I've defiled the rabbi because I touched the teacher and I'm unclean. She fell down before him and she, she told him all the truth. And look at what she found there. She found first a Messiah who always recognizes the touch of faith of his own. She found a Messiah who always recognizes the touch of faith that comes from his own. Get the picture here again. Jesus is on his way to the home of Jairus. This crowd is crushing up against him. There's an emergency at the end of the story. And it's the gentle touch of a frightened yet believing woman that stops him in his tracks. And he says, who touched me? The crowd probably didn't understand the question. The disciples think he's being ludicrous. Master, look at this. Everybody's, everybody's touching you. How can we tell you who touched you? How can we figure out who it was? J. Iris, surely he's getting antsy. His daughter's dying. And Jesus has stopped the parade to talk to a woman, that's bad enough, to an unclean woman, to a dying woman. Who touched me? Maybe they didn't understand the question, but something had happened. Faith had touched his garment, and no crowd is so big and no need is so pressing, including in this chapter, the impending death of a little girl to stop Jesus from feeling the touch of hurting people. And here's why that matters to me today. 
I think about all the believers around the world crying out to Jesus at any given moment. All the people pressing up against the Redeemer with needs and heartache and discouragement. And you know what? It doesn't matter how many people are pressing up against him. If you're hurting today, if I'm hurting today, we can reach out and touch the hem of his garment, and he does not miss our touch. She found a Messiah that felt her touch. And then she found a Messiah who welcomes her into his family. Here's the text. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Daughter. Daughter, he called her. Affirming her faith. Granting her peace. Saving her soul. So that she, she had come to Jesus unclean and she would go away cleansed. She had come to him broken and she would go away healed. She came to him hopeless and she went away with new life. She came to him desperate and she would go away in peace. She came to him an outcast and she walked away a daughter. And that's what happens when you meet the Redeemer. That's what happens when we introduce somebody to the right person. Look around us, helpless, hurting, desperate people. And you and I have the answer. It matters that we direct people to Jesus. And here's our faith, Jesus is still the right person to whom we direct people. And he always will be. Some, some years ago, I was reading an article in Newsweek magazine. It was an article about America at war. And there was an article that included a brief recollection of a staff sergeant who was present in 1945 at the liberation of one of the German concentration camps in Dachau. And I read that story, and, and here's what caught my attention. He, he's telling what they experienced as a, as a troop, and he said, that wasn't our primary mission. That wasn't our goal. The troops that liberated that particular camp had not set out for that purpose. Rather, they had another target. They had another mission. They had another plan that they needed to accomplish. But on the way, doing their mission, they heard the screams of people from down the mountainside. And they followed the sounds. And they would find themselves becoming the liberators of men who had become walking death, some who had been strung up on poles. These troops, they had someplace else to be. They had another mission they had to accomplish. They had other things they needed to get done. But they did not miss and they did not ignore the cries that they heard from the mountainside. The cries of the desperate diverted them to a more immediate need. Today, and I say this to me as much as to anybody, in the midst of your busyness, whatever you're doing, whatever you've got to read, whatever you must write, whatever presentation you must prepare, don't miss the glancing touch of desperate, hopeless people around you. Like Jesus, be sensitive and be stopped by their touch. 
And then, like these unnamed characters or character in Mark 5, whoever it was that directed this woman to Jesus, like that person, direct people to Jesus. And guess what? Something might just happen when you introduce others to the right person. Let me pray for us today. Almighty God, thank you for those who loved us enough to introduce us to your son. I pray this day, Father, that you would, you would make us sensitive to the hurting around us. That we would not walk past a brother or sister whose heart is breaking. That we wouldn't ignore those that, as far as we know, are non-believers who might talk differently, think differently, act differently, but who are looking for answers in all the wrong places. God, don't let us get so busy getting this stuff done that we miss the people. And Lord, I, I do pray today, if there, if there are those among us who are just hurting, even as believers, desperate, struggling. God, grant us faith just to reach out and touch the hem of your garment. And remind us today, no matter how desperate we are, no matter how clean, unclean we are, you don't miss our touch. Thank you for making us your sons and your daughters. Thank you for the privilege of introducing others to you the right person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.